the Guyana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, in collaboration with the Linden International Reunion Association, presents Reset. This is a conversation exploring realistic, everyday solutions-oriented empowerment techniques on issues of health, relationships, and building strong families. Join us and be part of this innovative, instructive, and inspirational initiative which will provide the exact ideas you need to reset your life. This is Reset. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second edition of our series on conflict resolution. Today, I have the privilege of uh, uh, joining me here, Dr. Lael Caesar and Dr. Horatius Gittens. Gentlemen, and anyone can start first, would you please just introduce yourselves to the audience? Uh, I know you're both uh, Guyanese, uh, birth, living in the diaspora in the United States. Would you please just introduce yourselves? Yeah, I'm Lael Caesar, like he said, and uh, it's my privilege to be associated with these noble gentlemen. I, my studies have been in uh, Hebrew Bible, and uh, I've been an Old Testament professor for many years. Um, but the book I paid the most attention to on and published the most on is the book of Job, which is as much tension, frustration, clash, and confusion as you could ask for. And I pray that the insights that God gives from such study uh, assist in this project of conflict management and conflict resolution. Thank you. My name is Horatius Gittins, as, is in the, as was stated. My studies are in the field of psychology, margin family therapy, and theology. And I'm very happy to be associated with both Dr. Carrell and, and Dr. Caesar in this program today. Uh, my work focused a lot on psychological functioning, marital relationships, intermarital beauty and intermarital conflicts. And um, I've worked in that field, being attentive to individuals and families and, and couples and groups in various types of psychological, social um, interactions and functioning. And I'm hoping that that might contribute something that would enhance our understanding of conflicts and resolving conflicts as we participate in this discussion today. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your uh, introduction. Now, I want us to uh, deal with a particular uh, situation here where uh, there is a lady by the name of Mary who has, uh, she had two grandchildren. She was at about 40 years old when she had these two grandkids. They are two girls, uh, about three, four years old. So they're toddlers. And uh, Mary uh, showed serious and overt favoritism to uh, one of the granddaughters who was of a lighter complexion. And, and, and she would often uh, show special deference to this uh, fairer skin uh, uh, grandchild. Uh, and this unfortunately led to resentment and constant conflict between these two siblings. As they grew older, they grew further apart. Um, and this resentment led to so much conflict that they decided after they got to the stage of leaving home that they are actually, they weren't even talking to each other for almost 30 years. Unfortunately, Mary passed away. And at the repass of her funeral, uh, it so happened that her two granddaughters are there and you saw them. You saw how they weren't even speaking to each other. This rift that has occurred for several years, it was still the, 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 the tension between these two sisters, it was palpable. Now, 
starting with you, Dr. Caesar, if you had the opportunity to meet with Mary when these girls were at the ages of three and four, uh, uh, what would advice would you give to Mary if you had seen the favoritism that she was showing to this sister of a lighter complexion? Uh, and you have also, you would have noticed also the conflict between these two girls. Uh, what advice would you give to Mary? I, I think the first thing I would do was ask Mary a question. Tell me, Mary, what do you love most about each of these cute kids who are your granddaughters? And, and a lot of what we do reminds you of yourself. You know, living in Mexico, I, I worked at university in Mexico for four and a half years, and I learned something that I kind of didn't know before. You know, it happens in Guyana too, but it just got reinforced after I left Guyana and ended up living in, in Mexico. And what happens in Mexico is that uh, folks openly declare their preferences for one or other of their kids. You know, she's a cute little girl and she does stuff and the other one isn't allowed to do yeah, that. The other one's gotta be strict. And they call her la consentida. This, she's the pampered one. She's the, the spoiled one. You know, in Guyana, the mothers would say, you see this one here, he bad. And she's hugging him up and rubbing his head and affirming him all the time, but he bad. And the others long for some of that same affection. And too often what happens is that we pamper and affirm the one with his bad ways, and he may grow up to be stubborn and rude and disrespectful of authority and disobedient to, to people here because, because we taught him what we didn't teach the other. On the other hand, the girl who is not affirmed keeps looking at, at I've been told by the psychologist that kids, uh, your kids are now more conscious and aware of life than you are as their grandmother. And they pick up stuff, even if you think they don't, they, they don't notice it. And it affects them. It affects them in ways that Dr. Giddens can say more about. Dr. Giddens, tell us more from the perspective of the specialist about the impact of favoritism on, on, on Mary's two kids. Well, that's interesting. Um, also, it's interesting that you call me a specialist. I like that kind of term, but sometimes it's not as useful. But what you're on to there might reflect something I'm just trying to deduce from this, um, from the questioner here. It sounds as if the two children, one is darker than the other. And that goes to something that sometimes we refer to as, as a reflection of some aspect of what we might call in the brighter, broader discussion, race. So it sounds to me as if the child has, these two children had different racial appearances, to use the word loosely. When we talk about race, we are really talking about a, some type of biological dis distinction that is manifested more in appearance, color of skin and other features, length of hair, etc. We talk about that race. That's a kind of a phenotypic appearance that, that shows in individuals, but it doesn't represent any cartological, any intrinsic difference or superiority of one over the other. So as I listen to this question, I'm thinking that there is something in this grandma's mind that she may not be conscious of that's impacting her behavior. And that is an attitude. What is the attitude? Something that she believes, 
something that she feels and something that she has a predisposition to act in a certain way, favorite towards one versus the other. And it sounds to me as if the one she's acting, she has a positive, she has a th thought about maybe thinking this one is better than that one. That's the force what she's thinking. And then she has a feeling much more positive to that one. And then she has a predisposition to behave, resulting in behaviors which are more affectionate to one versus the other, if you see what I'm saying. And that contributes to feelings of inferiority versus superiority between the two children. Hence, I think the source of the conflict. So what grandma was doing there, she was teaching something to the children inadvertently, probably not deliberately, I should say, but they were catching it because as parents, our grandparents, guardians, what we do when we are attempting to teach children, our teachings are more caught than taught. So that's part of what may have been happening there as I listen to this discussion about grandma. So grandma could have had um, some kind of, um, um, someone could have spoken to grandma about that if they had the opportunity to yeah. speak to her and could have spoken to her about that. Dr. Carol, did you okay. mention that she was married to a dark skinned guy and that she herself experience backlash from her family? I didn't, but that's a very important point. No, you can you can embellish on that, but that is absolutely true. She 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 herself mm -hmm. was in the context of her own family. She was rejected and actually she lost her inheritance from that mm -hmm. family. So it's interesting that she was the recipient of the kind of being shunned in her uh, from her family because of her married marriage to a, 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 a darker, a, a man of African descent. Um, and, and, and she experienced that, but now she is herself showing that level of favoritism. Now that's an interesting uh, observation. Is, is there some kind of a, Dr. Gittins, is there some kind of a, um, a, a, an explanation to why someone who was discriminated against turns around and do, does the same? There's probably an explanation. One type of explanation can be that sometimes people within our societies, we learn things which are um, promulgated about us without recognizing that we are in fact learning these things. And so they're kind of, you know, the stereotyping might have been happening around her. When I talk about stereotyping, I literally mean, you know, People, you know, have certain beliefs about individuals based on how they look, what category of people they belong to. So that can be something that that's about there. And even though she suffered as a result of it, she may have learned that and she might have some of that simply put that or her own self-hatred because of what was perpetuated, you know, in her society, something that's very difficult. And sometimes as a result of that, people also haven't had that 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 kind of negative belief about a certain people group. They can move from that and then they can have what we might call prejudice, negative feelings towards a certain group just because of how they look. So that can be something else that can happen. So she has the stereotyping which was imposed upon her. And then there's this prejudice that was around her and she could have you know, utilized, she could have, as we would say, drink from that same well. She might have done that. And then the third thing that may have been happening to her is that she now learned to behave. Now, this, 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 this stereotyping is something we kind of believe negatively. And the prejudice is a negative feeling. And now the she started what she is not recognizing, she is discriminating against her own kinfolk with no basis for doing that other than the appearance of the skin. Now, Dr. Carl, what I want to just sum up here, just before I stop this comment and let Dr. Season, what I want to say is that these things happen, the, the, you know, the, the, the stereotyping, this developing negative beliefs about people, or beliefs, some negative, some positive, just because of the parents, and then feelings some negative, some positive, that's, that, that's a prejudice, just because of appearance, and then negative behaviors, behaviors towards people, 
positive or negative, appropriate or inappropriate, just because of appearances. These are things which have been transmitted from one generation to the next culturally. And sometimes people are not recognizing that they have these things in them and they they, they do them to people in society. They do them broadly to others in society and then do behave that way towards their own kinfolk. In this instance, your own flesh and blood without realizing it or sometimes realizing it, but deliberately perpetuating it. And that can be dangerous. And Dr. Car Dr. Caesar, what I really want to know, do you have a kind of ideological or, or, or philosophical disposition that would help to explain how people can have these negative versus positive dispositions to other people just because of what I would call the racial background, the racial presentation? Do you, do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, the first thing I'd like to say is how startling it is as it comes home to me, as you speak, to recognize that you can have race-based discrimination within your own family unit. That, that is startling. And- um, That's a reality, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, think it, I think it's a reflection on the nature of human nature. Um, mm -hmm. Often enough, we have established our categories based on skin color or last name or the location of the village I was born in or my parents or my auntie or my rich uncle. The truth is that the category distinctions are not based on color mm. or geography. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who stood up for principle and as a result of it was punished and tortured and suffered long imprisonment uh, in the Soviet Union and eventually was able to leave and live a free life and make awesome statement. Alexander Solzhenitsyn says that the line between good and evil passes through every one of us. I am sure that Grandma Mary had no desire to be evil. That's a dreadful word. No grandma. Uh, or do anything evil to her grandkids. But what she actually was doing was developing a spirit of jealousy and bitterness on the part of one of her grandkids and own wayness and uh, disrespect on the part of the other. And uh, I know the question began with uh, a proposal. It was Dr. Carroll's question was positive. What could we do? And if I had to talk to Mary now, I think I would like to ask her about the love rule. And if she'd like to apply the love rule to her relationships with her with her grandkids, because the love rule does a great job of keeping a family together. And it's not, you don't need to do research and to get a degree. The love rule is seven words. Mm. Treat them just like you treat yourself. Treat her just like you treat yourself. The same attention that equal attention because you don't like the idea of being left behind or overlooked or set aside or knocked down. You love to be valued and appreciated and affirmed. So that's what you would like for everybody you know and love. Equal attention, equal affirmation, equal encouragement, gracious discipline. Because of course, we all need someone to help us go right or do the right thing. The truth is, that if we deal with our grandkids or anybody else for that matter, if we deal with them the way we would like to be dealt with, if we give them the love that we would prefer to be given ourselves, we will be teaching, and you've already made this point, we will be teaching them how to treat other people. And besides 
Mary's two grandkids. There are lots of other people who get good loving from their parents and aunties and uncles and grandma and people who don't. So if Grandma Mary, I'd say Grandma Mary, given how much you love your grandkids, both of them, because I know you love both of them. If you were to give them both the love rule, treat them just like you treat yourself. Treat them just as you treat yourself. They will revel in your smile. They will revel in your hug. They will revel in the nice gift of warm favor that you will give them. And it will have astonishing relationships to them academically, cerebrally, emotionally, stability in, in ways that we ourselves can't imagine. You wanted to say more? Yeah, that? yeah. Let, me, let, me just, let me just shift because of, let, let's shift and twist this a little more. Okay, yeah. um, and either one of you can, can answer this. But now that Mary has been counseled, but this is later that unfortunately her granddaughters didn't get that unfortunate, that blessing of that love uh, that was, you know, seen equally by both, if you may. Um, but if a person has now internalized that prejudice, if they began to experience their the recipients of the uh, of the actions, negative actions taken against them because of their race or their color. Uh, um, my question is, if the person now has this as a part of their experience, mm -hmm. how do you help that individual, both of you gentlemen, deal okay. with? Because we want that person to now, so we are talking to her two granddaughters, Ma Mary's granddaughters now, what would you advise or tell them or counsel them? Well, that, that's, a, that's a real, that's gonna be a real tough one because you've, you've, you've mentioned something that has happened already. A, a harm has been done to mm -hmm. them and that harm probably, we can say based on this scenario that you created, that harm happened over time. Sounds as if you have multiple decades, maybe two decades already going on since this has been happening. Something got, you know, something was is, is deeply seated in them. So part of what we would want to do, part of what we might uh, attempt to do is to ask them to start thinking about, let's, let's come up here with some goals. What kind of outcomes you want um, within your relationship within, with, for the relationship you have with each other? And that, that can be a place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you framed it, as, as I remember, the way you framed it, they seem to have had some proclivity, some inclination to want to enhance their relationship with each other. And in my way of thinking, that, that can take me back to Dr. Caesar's love rule. I think one great philosopher said it another way. And, and, and I read this, you know, the Jewish rabbis, used to teach the school of um, um, Shammai and the school of Hillel. They used to teach the principle, their rule was whatsoever you don't want people to do to you, don't do to them. And one I think infinitely greater than them said, no, that's not the rule. Whatsoever you would that people should do to you, do ye even so to them. That's that love rule. That's a kind of spirituality thing that, that transcends multiple religious um, groups and multiple philosophical groups, this love rule. So with these young people, with these young people, I would start them there and I would introduce them to this principle. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to start to work with them on that, that one. What kind of outcomes you want for your relationship? And I'm going to start to build. I'm going to see how I can start to build on this whole principle of loving each other, seeing how you can and have some kind of um, development of a of a new quality relationship with each other. The other thing you have that is difficult there is to have the unlearning of that which was negative and the relearning of that which is positive. And here we start to look at the intrinsic value of you as a human being, whoever's feeling that 
and one of the things we might suspect here, some one of them, or maybe both of them, has a lower self-esteem than they should have, a negative view of themselves. So now we're trying to retrace, we're trying to refix, we're trying to fix that by reteaching something else. You are infinitely and intrinsically valuable as a human being. It had nothing to do with the color of your skin. It had nothing to do with the length of your hair. It had nothing to do with any of those things about how you look. It had something to do with how you were created as a, as a valued, infinitely valuable person. So that can be a place we can start. The intrinsic value of the human, uh, human being. And by the way, that's part of what is being eroded in societies when we teach these negative things over time culturally. Sometimes people have imbibed, you know, dispositions, negative dispositions that they just got handed over to them from one generation to the next without stopping to be critical about how this came about. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Caesar um, can also speak to this man. We know, what, what, where, where do some of these things come from? Is there some, is there some, some root cause for these, these negative feelings, this, mm -hmm. this deliberate disposition towards hostility to other people because of how you look? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want mm -hmm. to speak a little bit to yeah. that. I, I would first, once I've expressed my condolences at their loss, I would want to congratulate Mary's daughters. I don't know what their names are, Elizabeth and Desiree. You can make oh, names. Uh, that would work. Okay, Liz and Desiree. I would congratulate them because despite the fact that they have been a part for so long, there is something in their hearts of love for each other because both of them wish this thing could be fixed. And, uh, and I think that moving on from there, the best thing I could do for Liz and Desiree is just what I would have tried to do with Grandma Mary. There's a precious line. I'm back on love because love is great. Being loved and loving is wonderful. And, and I read this line from a man who came to be known as the apostle of love. This, this, this goes way back, but the apostle of love was writing a note to a friend of his named Gaius, G-A-I-U-S. This is not the fictitious friend. Neither is the apostle a fictitious. The apostle is a real man. Let me say, oh, long ago and far away. No, this is not a fairy tale. The apostle of love, his name was John. And his friend's name was Gaius. And John wrote to Gaius and said, you know what, beloved friend? You know what I wish for you more than anything else? is that your body be sound and your soul be safe. Uh, there are official translations of those words and uh, here is one of them. And it says, dear friend, I, I know that you are spiritually well. I pray that you're doing well in every other way and that you're healthy. I think what John is saying to Gaius that, that would benefit Desiree and, uh, and, and Liz. What, what John is saying to you, Liz, you all have very different gifts. You've got different temperaments. And uh, you're through with high school and college, but you have different hopes and dreams. And what Grandma Mary could have done for you, what you wish she had done for you, still can be your experience. It isn't too late, although at least two decades have passed and you're into your third decade. It isn't too late for you to think of that line from John, the apostle of love. I want you to be spiritually sound and I want you to be physically healthy. You see, the point is, the nexus between the physical and the spiritual has not always been acknowledged as it should be 
Now people will tell you 90% of, of human afflictions and medical complaints are psychosomatic. A lot of what's been a challenge in your life, Desiree, and in your experience, Liz, is stuff that would go away if we could get this straight. If you would realize that a security in your spirit and contentment emotionally and soundness physically, if you would realize that they are all so inextricably intertwined, you would be willing to continue this effort to be reconciled. You, you would find it as you think, you know, it will help me. I'm not helping anybody by being bitter against them. The bitterness is killing me. I want to give it up and I want to take love instead. So reach out to each other. It's the, it's, it's the beginning of a better life for both of you. No, that's, uh, that's powerful. I, I do want us to shift for the last part of our conversation. And if I understand you, Dr. Cesar, I'm hearing you saying to Desiree, listen, that resentment is not good for you. It's not no. good at all. But also I'm hearing you saying you need to replace it with some, get rid of this, but replace it with love. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I yeah. heard that important point. Now let's Here's go. Here's line. Yeah? Uh, very quickly, very quickly. Yes. I read this today. It's from a book called The Ministry of Healing. Mm. And it, the comment is a comment on that same line from John the Gaius. The comment is that those words, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, just like you prosper and are spiritually healthy. Those words are what God desires for every human being. God, the God who is love, wants all of us to be healthy in mind and in spirit. And bitterness can give way to love. And enmity and apathy can give way to friendship. And we will be warm where we were cold. We will be embraced where we were once alone. Thank you so much. The last part of our discussion focuses on, on the other sister who was experiencing the favoritism. Mm -hmm. Who over time felt she was actually a little better than her sister. That, and then society started to reinforce that as she was mm -hmm. of fairer complexion, she realized she got the job over- In the bank. The, yes, yes, in the <laughs> bank. No, no, society somehow, what do you tell this sister mm -hmm. who is in her own head feeling a sense of I am better than this darker person mm. and maybe all the things that you have shared are still applicable but I want us to address my dear sister because I want her also to experience mm. what you said God wants for all his children that sense of wholeness that's the other word I'm not a scholar in that ear but the word I've learned is wholeness yeah that's Both in my shalom head. and shalom oh. is peace but mm. it doesn't just mean the absence of bullets flying it means wholeness, oh. togetherness. And it's not a wholeness that is limited to single individuals. It's a wholeness where brothers and sisters embrace and fathers and mothers and strangers all know we belong to the same family. But I think I'm speaking so, out of turn. So, so what, would, what do we say but to this sister? Well, you're continuing along the same vein to speak directly a question there, Dr. Dr. Carroll. Um, to continue along the same vein is to part of what we have a responsibility her is to help clarify yes. what she is experiencing and what she may have um what she may have taken in from grandma that's not particularly appropriate mm -hmm. and that would that would revolve around one of the terms that we use she has internalized the racism there also that's not helpful and by the way the racism is different you know, from the prejudice or the hatred or the discrimination. The racism really revolves in society when an individual is part of a group that is often the majority that mm -hmm. has, that group has the power to perpetuate the discrimination, 
the prejudice that we, that we've been talking about, the negative, the negative stereotypes. So we want her to become aware of what she might be dealing with. That's not necessarily helpful. This is not in contrast to the love principle that we were working with. It's consistent with that. And we are asking her now to look for ways to embrace and to recognize that a privilege that she might have experienced um, though it was different from her sisters, doesn't necessarily mean that she was intrinsically superior to the sister. It may just mean that more privileges and opportunities were opened up to her, which were not opened up to her sister. So we start, that's one place we can start. I would tell her about, I, I might also, as I embrace her and show her all, all the positive qualities she has, I think Dr. Caesar went over that. They both have some real positive qualities. So we want to embrace and affirm that the fact that she's here now willing to address this, this is this is good. What I would one of the things I might try to do also is to engage her with a conversation that I probably would have had with grandma if I knew grandma way back then. And that is a question I would ask grandma, which practically is appropriate for most parents to ask. To, for me to ask grandma, grandma, what is it you want to accomplish in your training of these children? What do you want, when you are gone, what do you want them to know? And, and when I asked grandma that question, I would tell her, in, in my way of thinking, I might say, help grandma answer that and say, what you're attempting to do, grandma, is to nurture these children to maturity and competence so that they can function in all the important areas of life. The question grandma is trying to answer, what I'm trying to help grandma clarify, you're looking to nurture them to maturity and competence so that they can function well in all the important areas of life. What are those important areas? Already mentioned, physiologically, mentally, academically, emotionally, um, vocationally, socially, with legal issues, spiritually, that's how we want them to function. And so I would show her that some of what she have learned, she has learned, may not be her fault, you know. So let's see if we can unlearn those and put in because what grandma was not necessarily trying to help was to teach you how to live in harmony mm. with your sibling and with other people, because that con communication that you are superior is not useful. It's not consistent with what Dr. Caesar articulated a little earlier, that we all, all of us would be in good health and be in positive relationship with each other. So that might be something that I might try to work through or also. An important question, I dare say, for all parents to consider, what are you attempting to accomplish in your training of your children, if you're gonna do it successfully, should you be able to look back years ago, what would you accomplish? And to help them answer, you might say, I am attempting to accomplish a nurturing of these children to maturity so that they can competently function in all the important areas of life, including their relationship with each other as siblings. Excellent. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, as we wrap up, here's the final question. Do you have any closing thoughts in addition to anything that was said, anything that you want to say now uh, before we conclude? I'm thinking of uh, another conversation that took place thousands of years ago on a place called Mars Hill. It's a place where uh, Athenian philosophers used to get together and uh, trash talk and whatnot. And uh, once they had a visitor, a stranger, he was Jewish, but he was very sophisticated Jew. His name was Paul. And he, uh, he got into conversations with people in the, in the marketplace. That's not where they sold, you know, anyway. And they thought, you know, let's, let's take him up and have him speak to us. And I remember as, as we are wrapping up here, one remarkable line that he gave to his listeners, we are all one blood. We are all one blood. The Athenian sophisticate thought the rest of the world outside of Athens was barbarian. And what Paul said, imagine in that contrast between Greek and barbarian, also needs to be said in the ears 
of the favorite, I don't know if it's Liz or Desri, needs to be said in her ear, we are all one blood. Because if we say it to her, I think it will have an impact that, that will jolt her. Telling the Greeks, you know, you are actually on the same level with the barbarians is, is all well and good. But telling Liz or Desiree, whoever she be, you know, your sister you look down upon, you and your sister are one blood. Let's see if we can live like that. We are all one blood. Dr. Carol, you and I are one blood. Dr. Giddens, you and I. That's right. That's right. Oh, well. Yeah. Powerful. And, and just to extrapolate just a little further, staying on the same vein, mm -hmm. um, the issue, the, what, the way I hear you say that is as if you're sounding to me as saying it's the fatherhood of one God. Uh -huh. That's mm -hmm. what it sounds like you're saying. The brotherhood, the sisterhood of all people. That's what it sounds like you're saying to me. And the creation of these distortions in human relationships that we have named stereotyping, prejudice, um, um, and, and, and discrimination and racism. Those are the creations of someone who is not God. That's the anti-God force yes, there. Yes. And so because we all live and move and have our very being, as the very philosopher Paul said, in him, this God, the creator, we live and move and have our very being. Because that is so, we ought to be careful and cautious. All people, Desiree and, 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 and the other child, they swear over the names of all of, uh, all of us, because we are all in that situation. We all, nations, peoples in nations, governments, all need to be attentive to the fact yeah. that to practice, to believe, to be stereotyping, to be hostile to others because they're different, to be yeah. discriminating and to be racist, that's not of God. Mm -hmm. That's not of God. We have a more noble way to yeah. live. The lovely I, I, I couldn't end it any better. That was on a perfect note to end. Ladies and gentlemen, we do want to thank you again for joining us and on this, the second edition on the series on conflict resolution. And we ask you to stay tuned as we will be presenting you with a third uh, uh, member in this series at a later date. Thank you again and God bless.